Kia uh, My French teacher at school used to tell me I must go into the diplomatic corps uh, because I was good at French. Uh, I never thought that was my destiny, I have to say, a view which was underlined by my MA falling on the wrong side of the border between first and second class. Uh, I defaulted to journalism, uh, where I sat at the feet of the illustrious elite we commemorate today. And two in particular, Tom Larkin and Ken Pennington, patiently tutored this country boy in the late 1960s and early 1970s. I would zip up from the parliamentary press gallery to their external affairs department uh, offices on the third floor. And many other patient people have cajoled and guided me here and on my infrequent forays abroad. Uh, and at the Institute, uh, Institute of International Affairs seminars. Thank you all. The cocktails served to me were not those for which ministry staff are often stupidly belittled. They were a nourishing brew of knowledge and navigation of the mysterious realms they orbited in, loyal to their political masters and mistresses, but also mindful of the nation's deeper, broader, longer ranging interests and of the wider world. And never more than now is that strategic and nimble intelligence needed. The liberal democracy under stress is the 500 year North Atlantic hegemony of ideas, the Vasco da Gama era, gives way to a geopolitics Marco Polo might have recognized as a restored Chinese empire flexes its muscles. Uh, as an uh, illiberal United States responds with glib talk of a new Cold War, which is causing some to fear a Thucydides trap akin to the war we've been commemorating these past four years. The Arab region in turmoil and flux, a would-be Russian empire, an ambitious India, an existential threat from climate change, all unpicking the rules-based order we value and need for our economic and national security. And to ease us through that unruliness, foreign affairs people must be, as Richard Seddon said in 1904 about the High Commissioner in London, some of the hardest worked officers of the public service, sub subordinate to the government and the parliament of the day, and voicing the desire of the people. Well, it's my privilege to introduce two substantial prime ministers. Helen Clark, I made my politician of all my time in a sign-off column last December. Helen had from her student days a high personal interest in international affairs. From the fourth Labour government's backbench, she was a backbone builder of the anti-nuclear policy which divorced us from the United States and left us no choice but an independent foreign policy, overdue, I might add. As Prime Minister, Helen leveraged that independent foreign policy into a groundbreaking, ground, and groundbreaking free trade agreement with China. A couple of missteps aside, I rated her conduct of foreign affairs outstanding. <laughs> I'm not sure what the joke is. <laughs> alongside that of Peter Fraser, earning respect from leaders of some much bigger countries. Helen then went global to the United Nations third ranked position. Jim Volger was derided by some, not me, as Spud because he came off a farm. He proved anything but Spud as Prime Minister, as I came to realize and recognize, though more slowly than he thought warranted. I have written, including in a history of the National Party's 50th to 80th years, that Jim's prime legacy is to have continued the journey towards biculturalism the fourth Labour government began. He embedded the Treaty of Waitangi settlement process. Jim also, in effect, embedded the anti-nuclear and independent foreign policies. He did both against large majorities in his caucus and party which required courage and a sense of destiny. Jim then turned diplomat in Washington, serving Jenny and Helen. Helen Clark, welcome. Thank well, thank you, Colin. I won't comment on your missteps, but... Uh, <laughs> 
But uh, good morning, everyone. Too many distinguished people to acknowledge, but uh, congratulations to MFAT on the 75th anniversary and uh, on the partnership with the Institute to host the conference. Uh, Colin uh, did send Jim and me a little guidance on what we might speak about, our early recollections of uh, MFAT. Uh, the fourth Labour government period, uh, Colin was keen that I should comment on, uh, my interaction with the uh, ministry as Prime Minister, uh, and then I want to comment on interactions since then, and perhaps end up with uh, some uh, reflections at the end. So obviously my recollections don't go back anywhere near as far as some of the excerpts from books that were being read uh, from 75 years ago. But they, they do go back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs being situated on the third floor of the old Parliament building alongside the, uh, the office of the Prime Minister before the Beehive uh, was built. Um, and I guess there will be those here who have fond memories of that rather small and, and compact uh, accommodation. Uh, but my recollections mainly uh, go back uh, to being an opposition backbencher, and there is no lower form of life than an opposition backbencher. <laughs> Government backbencher is not much better, by the way, but um, I was put on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. And there was extensive interaction with MFAP because MFAP provided most of the briefings. This was 1981 to 1984. And the committee at that time didn't undertake inquiries. It often didn't meet for very long. It was maybe an hour a week. A week. Um, and I was casting my mind back to what briefing really stood out from those three years. And one that jumps always to my memory was poor David McDowell coming to brief the committee as the New Zealand High Commissioner to India, who was non-resident because the Prime Minister had decided that having a resident and the High Commissioner wasn't very sensible. And of course we had quite a lot of fun from the opposition cross-examining David McDowell, who, who batted loyally for the, for the case, uh, but not convincingly, I, I have to say. Uh, but my recollection is that the arrangement wasn't terribly well received by the Indian government. Uh, that New Zealand had been allocated land on which to build a high commission uh, in uh, Delhi. And during this period, the land was occupied only by Babu, the caretaker. And when David Longy became prime minister and uh, visited uh, India, he made a point of meeting Babu, who had loyally kept the flag <laughs> flying on the plot of land. Uh, uh, designated for the uh, High Commission uh, building and residence, which of course was eventually built and I, I understand occupied uh, to this day. And I'm sure relations with India improved immensely when Sir Edmund Hillary was appointed the High Commissioner because he had uh, great reputation and stature in, in India. So we, we move on to uh, 1984 to 87, which was quite a, a tumultuous time in New Zealand foreign policy because old orthodoxies uh, were questioned. And the old orthodoxies, I guess, were pretty embedded uh, in the leadership on the foreign ministry and, and indeed the whole foreign policy, defence and intelligent, uh, intelligence establishment in New Zealand. So my kind of minor role in this was to chair two committees. Uh, one was the Foreign Affairs Committee. It was not Foreign Affairs and Defence at that time. There was also a Defence Select Committee, which was chaired by my colleague, uh, Jeff Braybrook. And we did really change quite a bit the way the committee operated. We undertook inquiries. And the first major one was on New Zealand's relations with China, which, which MFAT was tremendously supportive of. And you know, one needs to think back to the times of 84, 85. This is only five, six years after Deng Xiaoping's reform program had begun uh, in China. It, it was uh, not the, the, the country we see today with the, the high rise, the, the neon lights, the, 
incredible uh, infrastructure. It was, uh, these were much, much simpler times. And our report, very much guided and informed by uh, MFAT and those who gave evidence to us, uh, talked about building a, a much broader relationship, needing to go beyond the official one to the trade, the people to people, encouraging the sister cities, all the things you do to, to, to flesh out uh, relationships. But it was an immensely different relationship from what we uh, uh, saw uh, uh, well, in these days. Uh, when we finally wrapped that one up, and it took quite a time, uh, we had some time to spare in the, in the parliamentary calendar till the end of the term. So we did a, a shorter inquiry into relations with Canada. And I sometimes think, could we have written much the same report today? And I remember it used a phrase um, that the relationship was comfortable like an old shoe, but it needed renewing. A country that we have so much in common with, but uh, often the relationship is a, is a bit thin because of, of distance and I guess uh, you know, not, not so much uh, trade as, as could be full uh, potential. But actually, my major memory from these three years chairing that committee was in a way not either of those inquiries. It was that I had to manage the senior opposition member who was none other than Sir Robert Muldoon, the just retired Prime Minister. And this uh, really caused me sleepless nights every week. Because you will recall, maybe Jim will recall, that he inspired fear in Parliament as Prime Minister. His cutting words could, could ruin a, a career. Now, of course, sitting as the senior opposition member on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, he was more, shall I say, a subdued giant. And my experience was when treated with respect, which I always treated him with, he responded accordingly. And actually we had quite a harmonious relationship on the committee, but it did require a lot of thought uh, and management. Uh, and this experience really uh, of, of managing that, and also seeing a number of uh, former prime ministers hang around parliament, persuaded me it was never a good idea for former prime ministers to hang around parliament too long. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a, an interesting time. Now, of course, in a way, the major foreign policy issue of the time uh, was dealt with in another committee. It was dealt with in the Disarmament and Arms Control Select Committee. Uh, and that committee, as I recall, finished a report that had been sought uh, uh, when the committee was established under the previous government. And Doug Kidd had had a very important role in this, and I think it was our job to actually finish off the report uh, when the uh, government uh, changed. And then uh, this informed the nuclear-free uh, legislation. So what do I recall of the ministry in this period? Well, it would be an understatement to say it wasn't terribly keen on this policy that Labour had been elected on. Um, the policy of making New Zealand a nuclear-free nation uh, with no nuclear-powered ships and no nuclear weapons on ships entering New Zealand ports. Uh, Questioning this did overturn some three decades of loyal ally status under the ANZUS uh, alliance. And it often seemed to me that the uh, approach of MFAT was to say, you know, New Zealand's so small and inconsequential that the most influence we can have in the world is to be close to the ear of the giant and whisper in it. Well, there's no evidence the giant ever listened, by the way, but uh, that seemed to me to be the approach. And I do recall going to the United States at the end of December 1984 at the invitation of disarmament campaigners there, who needless to say were extremely excited about what New Zealand was doing. And I spoke at various events and spoke to, to media. Uh, I did visit the New Zealand embassy in Washington, D.C., and I found well, rather worried officials who told me that doors that had always been open were now closed to them. And I guess, you know, that, that was the price of the policy. And I, I guess if one puts oneself in the position of officials who, you know, are working away at the relationship, government changes, new policy and approach, doors close, it, it can be uh, very, very uh, difficult, even on a personal uh, level. Um, now, as 
subsequent events and Official Information Act releases show uh, the officials then worked very hard uh, with American officials and probably Australian to find a way through this. And that became the proposal for the United States to send uh, the Buchanan to New Zealand, which was not nuclear powered, but the issue was, was it nuclear armed? Now, the US neither confirmed or denied policy, was never going to tell you uh, one way or the other on that, but there was a view that it might have had uh, or had the capacity to have uh, nuclear-tipped missiles. And as is well known, the Prime Minister was in the Tokelau Islands. If you never want to receive a phone call, go to the Tokelau Islands. <laughs> and uh, Deputy Prime Minister Geoffrey Palmer was in charge. As the issue played out, the call was made not to accept the Buchanan and then New Zealand really went into a very remote dog box in Washington, D.C., and George Schultz advised uh, David Longy that uh, we part as friends, but we part. And the relationship really went on ice with little traction for New Zealand and D.C. for years. Now, the government then proceeded from, from that point with the nuclear-free legislation, but it did one other thing, and that was to set up the... Defence uh, uh, Committee of Inquiry, chaired by Frank Corner. Um, I always felt this was an extremely unhelpful inquiry and set of conclusions, but of course it crashed against the prevailing political reality, which was that the government and the public uh, rather liked the policy. The legislation eventually passed, and over time, it came to be widely embraced as a symbol of New Zealand's independent uh, foreign policy. Uh, under Jim's uh, government, uh, the report of the Royal Commission on Nuclear Power looked for a while as though it, it might uh, open doors again in DC. Uh, but then uh, Jim's government's unwillingness to change the policy on nuclear weapons stood in the way of that. So on we, we went. Um, However, uh, the role of diplomacy is always to find ways to engage, even when there's major no-go areas. When I became Prime Minister in 1999, uh, relations with the USA were pretty much in the limbo they'd been in for some 15 years. Of course, New Zealand had got on and built on many other relationships, uh, especially in uh, East Asia. Uh, We'd long had the traditional close relationship with uh, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, a number of the ASEAN countries, but uh, clearly you know, the big developments were happening in the relationship with China as it uh, became a, an emerging economy and, and, and power uh, to be reckoned with. Uh, in Brussels, uh, obviously MFAT continued to work extremely hard on trade access and Prime Minister's visits to Brussels were always <laughs> informed by, uh, by that mission. Uh, Latin America. Officials I found when I came into office were really rather keen on some you know, new initiatives and lifting the profile in relations uh, with, with that region, which uh, I was also keen on. And we road tested a, a new strategy on New Zealand's relations with uh, Latin America when I attended uh, Ricardo Lagos's inauguration as president of Chile in March uh, 2000, and then took a, a very substantial New Zealand trade and official delegation to uh, Latin America in November uh, 2001. Um, now, I suppose the opportunity to reassess the US engagement came uh, with the 9-11 attacks, which were uh, very, very shocking and led New Zealand to become more engaged in the debate around international terrorism. And we did commit a presence in Afghanistan. In 2002, off the back of that, I visited the White House. That was the first visit since Jim had been in the early 1990s. And the previous visit had been one by Sir Robert himself way back in the 80s. So these were pretty few and far uh, between. But Clearly, there were openings to engage, again, around uh, different agendas. But having 
got that foot in the door, then along came the Iraq intervention, which my government declined to engage with, along with most uh, Western countries and, and, and the bulk of the rest of the world. So I guess the relationship went back on ice uh, a little. However, ways were found to restart conversations after the 2005 election, uh, and MFAT reported regularly to me on that. I then made a second visit to uh, the White House, uh, 2007 as I recall, uh, where there was acceptance on both sides that actually two Western countries uh, needed to find better ways of engaging with each other without letting the obvious points of difference always be a roadblock before you even started a conversation. I think that was you know, really quite a mature development in, in New Zealand foreign policy and, and MFAT did uh, good, good work on that. And none of it would have been possible without really assiduous long-term official engagement in building a dialogue to uh, that point. Uh, so in my years as PM, I interacted very extensively with MFAT at the cabinet committees, uh, obviously receiving international visitors, uh, traveling on official missions. And I will say without qualification that I was always very well served in those roles across uh, regions of the world and at major international meetings. And prime ministers go to a lot. You go to APEC every year. You go to the Pacific Island Forum. There was the East Asia Summit that developed uh, in the later years of my time, the Commonwealth every two years, the UN and major uh, conferences. Actually, I came to appreciate during my time at the UN uh, how difficult uh, the role of diplomats in multilateral discussions and negotiations actually is. I remember MFAT would come to brief us on the climate change talks and you know, sitting in your little bubble in New Zealand, you don't always realise how hard it is to get your point across. But it was very, very uh, hard. Um, and I remember also uh, in uh, the face of some ministers' enthusiasm to be rather hard on law and order, MFAT gently pointing out uh, that certain proposals wouldn't pass scrutiny uh, under the commitments we had to the human rights legislation. So MFAT always was a reality check. You know, you better be consistent with what you signed up to or you're going to attract uh, some rather unfortunate uh, attention uh, in uh, UN capitals. But uh, personally, I always found officials very dedicated and on top of their game. I, I was very aware that Ours is a small foreign ministry, we're a small country, uh, that expertise across all regions of the world can be a, a bit uneven, clearly we're more engaged in some uh, than others, but uh, never could in fact, be faulted for lack of effort. Um, and my experience or observation over the years has always been that it has been able to attract the best and the brightest students of uh, each generation, and I think that has served it well uh, too. Now, in New York, I interacted obviously with the New Zealand mission. Uh, when I first went up on the uh, campaign to become the administrator of UNDP, Rosemary Banks and her team threw their weight in behind me, which was extremely uh, uh, useful. Uh, and then, of course, during the uh, campaign for the Secretary General position, which ultimately was not successful, but I really can't think of anything that could have been done uh, differently, uh, except being born male and an East European who could attract the support of East and West. That might have made a, a difference. So I'm going to uh, conclude now with uh, six short reflections. Uh, the first is, I'm really pleased to see the expansion of the New Zealand physical presence offshore. Since my time, new post in Colombia, Addis Ababa, the new consulates in China, and now uh, Dublin and Stockholm coming on stream. Uh, secondly, I think uh, the multilateral presence is very important across New York, Geneva, Rome, Paris, uh, Vienna. Uh, New York has seemed quite well resourced, particularly when we're on the uh, Security Council, uh, but the others shouldn't be neglected either. There are important international agendas coming out of those. Uh, 
Uh, my third reflection would be that in recent years, I did uh, think that MFAT was perhaps a little bit hollowed out, leaving significant uh, experience uh, gaps. It can't be run just like a commercial corporation. I think diplomacy is a skill and a craft, and you need to invest in it and support long-term uh, professional uh, careers. Uh, fourthly, I think the non-partisan nature of MFAT is something very much to cherish. In my time as PM, I felt the approach was to support the government to implement its policies, uh, obviously to you know, point out where the difficulties could be, uh, but basically to uh, help you get uh, the job done. Uh, my fifth point, uh, diplomacy for New Zealand must be about more than trade. We do put an enormous amount of emphasis on it, sometimes almost to the extent, I think, of being single-minded, but there are many other very important agendas to New Zealand too. And my final reflection is, I think, New Zealand should be proud of its foreign service. Many of the postings our diplomats have are very challenging. Uh, they have to fight for attention for New Zealand as a small, uh, remote uh, country and capitals which really aren't terribly interested in us and often you know, live in places uh, where clearly uh, not only is the door not particularly open, uh, but living conditions aren't particularly salubrious either and physical security may be a major issue. But I had never heard anyone complain about any of that and that I think is the mark of dedicated professionals. Thank you. Jim. <laughs> Jim. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Helen, for that overview, we will touch on some points similar and uh, some that are many uh, quite, quite different. Good morning all. Good to see so many familiar faces. Acknowledge the diplomatic corps, they're not quite so familiar. My old colleague Don McKinnon, he wasn't a bad foreign minister in my judgment. I kept him, <laughs> kept him there for a long time, so he must have been quite good. Uh, no, greetings all. Brian Lynch, a neighbour. Good to see him. As you've heard from uh, Colin James, Helen and I were asked to reflect on our interaction with the ministry over our many years over the time. And I want to say up front that uh, I have very warm memories of the many times that I have had the good fortune to have a senior or times not so senior MFAT officer to offer advice while I was traveling on my journeys to many different parts of the world and many, many different countries. One such journey I was thinking of this morning is, was traveling with Ambassador Ian Hill, now in Moscow, to many countries in Central Asia, gathering support for New Zealand's Security Council bid back in 2014. Visiting countries where we, New Zealand, know little about their current status, much less their many layered and complex histories. A fascinating experience. It tells you you can't get very far away. Coming in on the train this morning, I got an invite uh, to return to Baku and Azerbaijan to speak to their conference there in March next year, and I will try and do that. Such future journeys, I thought I should observe, were not front of mind when I was elected MP for King Country back in 1972. I don't think I'd heard of Azerbaijan, no. We didn't talk much about it in the King Country, but uh, we will now. My initial contact then with MFAT was on my first venture into the wide world of Asia on a speaker's tour back in 1974. We visited the Philippines to the rebel-threatened island of Mindanao, I recall it, where our plane ran off the end of the runway. It was short, and we climbed out through the cornfields with the comforting words of the Filipino Air Force Colonel that was traveling with us, saying that any landing you walk away from is a good landing. <laughs> and I guess he's right. <laughs> that trip then went on to India, 
and we had quite a stay in India, Thailand, and back to Hong Kong. And that visit, in many ways, opened my eyes to the diversity and scale of our immediate neighbourhood. Well, immediate, compared with to England and the wider Europe where our traditional focus was. It was also my first and positive close-up engagement with officers of the ministry. In a way, the bookend of that visit was when, as Prime Minister 20-plus years later, speaking at a conference of economists, that's a risk, in Singapore, I stated that, from my perspective, New Zealand was part of Asia. Needless to say, that ruffled a few empire loyalist feathers back home here in New Zealand, but, you know, they should get a map. <laughs> 75 years is a long time by some measures, but in fact is a relatively short period, even for a, short, uh, even for a young country such as New Zealand. We tend to date our modern history, of course, from the signing of the treaty in 1840. And yet, we didn't set up our own independent foreign service for nearly a hundred, till nearly a hundred years later, in 1943. Prior to that, we, in part, substantive part, allowed our foreign service policy to be run and de uh, dictated from London. And we only became New Zealand citizens with the passing of the relevant legislation in 1948. We didn't rush to independence. Back in 1994, I caused another stir when I raised the likelihood of New Zealand becoming a republic within the Commonwealth. And it shocked people that I discussed this possibility with Her Majesty the Queen on more than one occasion. Very calm discussions. We'll see what the future, what the future brings us. But what it means is that we fought in World War I and World War II as British subjects. Last week, I, and this was what came to my mind, I launched to help launch a book in Auckland titled The Obscure Heroes of Liberty, written by New Zealander Dr. Kenneth Baker on the heroic efforts by civilians in Belgium to help escape New Zealand prisoners of the War of 1914-18. And many powerful and heroic and quite emotional stories are told in that book. But he makes the point uh, that while we were part of the British Empire in 1418, the Premier back then, Bill Massey, while seen by many as a very loyal empire loyalist, he in fact, within the constitutional constraints of the day, endeavoured to inject a distinctly New Zealand viewpoint into the war effort and the treatment, particularly the treatment of New Zealand soldiers. That in many ways, and Helen touched on this, in many ways is what through New Zealand through its ministers and officials have been doing ever since, injecting a distinctly New Zealand viewpoint into foreign policy and not just following other countries. The anti-nuclear debate and positioning in the 1980s and 90s was part of that New Zealand tradition of taking an independent stand on important issues. We have also adopted, of course, the same approach on trade. On the nuclear issue, I gave my first address to the UN as Prime Minister in 1991, and due to very good work, not quite sure how they did it, by our team at the UN, I spoke immediately before President G.W.H. Bush, the first George Bush, to a full house. Don't often get that if you're a small country. <laughs> as I pointed out to him later when we met, um, in, uh, he was very lucky that the delegates had come to listen to me <laughs> and stayed on for his speech. Well, that was my interpretation anyhow. Later, in our separate early evening meeting, read the nuclear standoff. He had his national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, with him, and I had our then UN ambassador, Terence O'Brien, with us. I don't know whether Terence is here this morning. Um, so Terence was with me, and that was the first meeting between the US President and New Zealand Prime Minister since, as Helen noted, the Muldoon-Reagan meeting back in 1983. That meeting was the first step in building back trust between our two countries. Two years later, at the first APEC leaders meeting in Seattle, while leaders sailed over to Blake Island where we held the meeting, I engaged this time with President Clinton on the nuclear issue. He agreed to review the policy he had inherited, that's how he put it and invited me to visit him in Washington, which I did in 1995. Progress was being made 
from a New Zealand perspective, and I guess America's on a very difficult effort. And Helen's government came in then and just kept that moving forward and she touched about the response to 9-11 and so forth, totally correct. I was in Washington by then. The first big international issue I was in a leadership position on was the international agreement to set up, establish the 200 mile exclusive fishing zones. After the election, see we were all driven by elections, after the election of the new government in 1975, I first became Under Secretary to Duncan McIntyre, Minister of Fisheries and Agriculture, Maori Affairs. But early 77, I became Minister of Fisheries and to meet the international requirements of that law, 200 mile fishing zone mandate, we had to rapidly grow our fishing industry to be in a position to sustainably harvest the, resource, the resources of our zone, the fourth largest in the world. A huge challenge. To that end, the then Prime Minister Robert Muldoon agreed that I could go to and discuss and inspect fishing operations in seven countries. A six week plus journey. I never agreed, as Don McKinnon will assure you, to any of my ministers being away for six weeks. Two weeks was long enough, and I'm sure Helen had the same rule. Robert was very generous that time. Or maybe he just wanted me out of the road. Who knows? <laughs> With us on that epic journey was the then Deputy Secretary of the Ministry, Ian Stewart, plus two fisheries experts from the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries. Ian, I recall, still was a tower of strength on the various international issues we inevitably confronted. The journey took us through the United States, then Canada and on up to Halifax, then to the English fishing city, Port of Hull, and for reasons I have to say I still struggle to recall, on to Yugoslavia. <laughs> well, it must have been the coast, wouldn't it? We, I have to say, we poisoned all the pot plants in the reception because the spirits they gave us to drink was undrinkable. So, oh. <laughs> then it was on to Moscow in the old USSR. There we were joined by the veteran Soviet Minister of Fisheries, Mr. Ishkov, who had been Minister of Fisheries since 1935. Yeah, imagine it. <laughs> he had survived all the spills and coups of the old Soviet system. We were also joined by our ambassador in Moscow, I think it was Jim Weir at that time, at our various meetings. Russia kindly provided an interpreter, a very smart young woman, Natasha, who I presume was also the KGB agent traveling with us as we flew out to Khabarovsk in the Far East. The Amur River at Kavaros, 600 miles from the ocean, was still over a mile wide and the home to 200 different species of fish, if my memory serves me right. But the important thing there, we had a fishing competition between the New Zealand delegation and Mr. Ishkoff's delegation. I'm sorry, I can't tell you who won. Then it was on the Trans-Siberian uh, train, overnight train for 17 hour journey down to the port city of Nahodka where the USSR's large Pacific fishing fleet, which was the basis of my journey, is based. As we had been on the road for the longest time, I asked the Russian officials as to whether our group could fly out of the closed city of Vladivostok rather than returning to Khabarovsk to continue our journey. At first, as expected, they declined, but later they relented and agreed that we could fly out of Vladivostok so after a very, very long farewell dinner on board a huge fishing trawler, we set out on a pitch dark night to drive at speed to the airport. Yes, we went to the then closed city, but the circumstances of the visit were such that we saw nothing, nothing other than a quick walk through a wing of the terminal and onto our plane and off to Japan and Korea. So I got there early, but saw nothing. I've told this story because the trip was interesting in its length and scope and engagement with various countries, but because the policies that were put in place following that long visit back in 1977 laid the foundation for New Zealand's modern fishing industry that employs thousands and earns 1.8 billion in overseas income. In 1977, our exports were just 28 million. After the 78 election, I became Minister of Labor and Immigration Regarding the immigration portfolio, which I only had for a short period, I vividly recall still 
My visit to a refugee camp on the barren, it had no natural water, island of Palau Bidong off the coast of Malaysia. This was a camp of up to 40,000 Vietnamese boat people who had fled from the south of the fall of then Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City. I make the general point that I came away from that visit totally impressed with the resilience of people caught up in such conditions and am firmly on the side of those who believe New Zealand should be more generous in accepting refugees. As Minister of Labour, I received instructions on appointment from Prime Minister Rob Muldoon to immediately resolve the many disputes that had halted work on then, uh, New Zealand's then largest construction project, the BNZ building down in the heart of the city. And because of endless stoppages, the contractors have been paid off on the half-finished Mangaree Bridge to the Auckland Airport. And at the Wellington port, port just outside the door, the new container crane desperately needed for the new, then new container trade was lying rusting on the ground. Good start. Yes, we resolved them and many, many others. It was a troubled time in labour relations in New Zealand. I am now, some say with irony, the chair of the fair pay panel for the current minister to help put in place a fairer pay structure. In developing our response, we must be aware of the various ILO conventions that New Zealand has signed up to. As, I might have put some of them through. As Minister of Labour, I took part in a number of ILO meetings in Geneva and was elected president of the ILO back in 1983. Leading a conference of a thousand delegates for a month is no easy task. And again, the support of officials was essential. The ILO established in 1919 as a tripartite organisation, meaning that delegates come from government, unions and employers. All have equal rights to speak. Needless to say, the, we didn't always agree. This was most graphically on display the year I was president, when the veteran union leader Jim Knox headed the New Zealand Union delegation. He had a crusty approach. That's one way of putting it and started his speech with the observation that he didn't intend to congratulate the president and wish him well in his tasks, as all others did, <laughs> but to criticize his actions back home. He got so carried away with his criticism that he forgot to stop when his time was up until I banged the gavel and brought proceedings back to order. All of this to the amazement and great amusement of this huge audience. They wondered what us New Zealanders were up to. Well, that's what it was. The steady hand in Geneva at that time was Terence O'Brien, who offered guidance and generous hospitality to the New Zealand delegates and many others. I'm not sure how big his hospitality bill was. I became Prime Minister after the 1990 election. You are all aware of the Bank of New Zealand issues we had to deal with immediately, as well as the general economic problems we inherited that had to be addressed. That noted, and Helen knows this too, as a trading nation, we had vital interest in international trade. And with that in mind, I decided that December I would attend what we hoped would be the last meeting of the Uruguay round of the GATT. I took with me the new trade minister, Philip Burden, and the outgoing trade minister, Mike Moore. The meeting was held in Brussels in a vast warehouse type building with an artificial stream running through the middle. Quite bizarre. Tim Grocer, later to be minister of course and ambassador in Washington at the moment, was the able MFAT trade person with me and despite very unpromising signs when we arrived, we believed we had to try and rescue the round. We almost made it. After endless bilateral meetings, with considerable help from the Swedish Trade Minister, who was chair of the Agricultural Panel, we called a Green Room meeting to gain acceptance of our proposal. All in the room agreed on the first run around the table. Excellent. But the chair paused a moment too long to bang the gavel down. And led by the Canadians, it all unraveled. A huge disappointment and the Uruguay round wasn't completed for another three years in 1993. The 1991 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, Chogham, was held in Harare, Zimbabwe. Chris Laidlaw was our ambassador stationed in Harare, and 
I had Simon Murdoch and Peter Kennedy traveling with me. The evening before the hard work started, there was a big gathering, a very large gathering of heads and officials from the Commonwealth countries and one other. That other was Nelson Mandela, only recently released from 27 years in prison. When Mandela arrived, I was fortunate to be near the entrance of the venue and the Secretary General of the Commonwealth back then, before Don McKinnon, Chief Anyoka, brought Mandela over to introduce him. As we chatted, out of the corner of my eye, I could see the snowy hair of Bob Hawke, Prime Minister of Australia, making rapid progress <laughs> through the crowd to where we were, and effectively brushed me aside and introduced himself. <laughs> I looked up and said to Mandela, thanks, etc. And Mandela said, great, we will catch up at breakfast then, Jim. The look on Bob Hawke's face said it all. <laughs> How the F? It's the same word that Simon Bridges used. <laughs> How is it Bolger is going to breakfast with Mandela? The answer was simple. Our MFAT staff had arranged it. That's how it happened. I have been forever grateful for that very smart move. It was at that breakfast, which was quite lengthy, only three or four of us there, at that breakfast that I gained my first insight into the remarkable spirit and soul of Mandela, who more than any other person left you with a sense of being with someone of great compassion, but equally great commitment. I had the great good fortune to be with Mandela on many later occasions and, of course, joined thousands and thousands of others to say farewell at his funeral in Johannesburg. New Zealand hosted Chogham in 1995, probably still our biggest conference ever, with approximately 50 heads of states and heads of government. It was at that meeting that South Africa rejoined the Commonwealth, of course, and it was also at that meeting New Zealand again bucked the historical norm of avoiding difficult issues at such conferences. The issue was that on the day preceding our retreat in Queenstown, the military government in Nigeria had executed world-acclaimed environmentalist Ken Sarawira and eight other human rights activists. I was determined that the conference had to respond. And with careful management of key personalities, great help I'd have to say from Nelson Mandela, we agreed to suspend the membership of Nigeria. Big call, largest country in Africa. A big call, but in my view, the right one. The list of times that personnel from MFAT were on hand to offer advice is almost without end, and frankly, I appreciated it all. There were many trips to our near neighbours, Australia and the Pacific Island countries. Such trips are more like family visits, such as the connection between us. But they must never be taken for granted. Further out, of course, we may be called on to offer home, a home to those displaced by rising sea levels in the Pacific. Two weeks back, I returned from a conference in Beijing where I met our current ambassador, Claire Fernley, lovely, nice embassy we have there now. For those of you who haven't been posted there, put your hand up. <laughs> very, very nice building, I'd have to say. I did, and, and I recalled earlier visits to China to meet with President Jiang Zemin and Premier Xi Rongji and many other leaders in politics and business in China. On those visits and bilateral meetings, it was very, very clear that China was and is on the move. And of course, New Zealand moved early itself to recognize China, or Beijing as the uh, head of China back in 1972, the election of the Kirk Labor government, and uh, he says, I've only got two pages to go. Uh, <laughs> I heard something on my left. Uh, so we moved early to recognize China, and we've moved early on a number of other, areas, in other places like the Free Trade Agreement. A yeah, trip to Vietnam, I had the pleasure of opening a new embassy in Hanoi in the consulate office in Ho Chi Minh City. Also in Spain, open new embassy there. We're starting to move out, as Helen was talking about. Magnificent expo display, of course, also uh, brought me there. Uh, I had returned visits to Russia and recall a meeting with President Yeltsin, which was only last 10 minutes. His welcoming comments went on for 22 minutes. <laughs> and it took 45 minutes to complete the meeting. <laughs> 
I have visited many countries, met many leaders in my time as minister and prime minister. But in 1997, on returning from attendance at the Edinburgh Chogham, I was told I was out as prime minister. I reflected on that and then, in effect, posted myself as ambassador to Washington. <laughs> Like Helen, former Prime Minister shouldn't stand around. I'm with her entirely. In other words, I joined the MFAT team. I crossed sides and in turn offered advice to visiting Prime Ministers, Ministers and various others who were visiting the US. I recall in particular the occasion the new Foreign Minister, Phil Goff, now Mayor of Auckland, arrived to advise his counterparts that the new Labour government wouldn't be proceeding with the proposed purchase of the F-16 fighter planes. I'd done a lot of work to get that deal done. <laughs> the message, I have to say, was calmly received, and frankly, on reflection, it is hard to see in what circumstances the fighter planes might have been used. We enjoyed working closely with the MFAT team in Washington. I had two excellent deputies in George Troop and David Walker, and right through the whole of the MFAT team, including all the support staff. Joan and I were warmly uh, supported by the, whole, by the whole mission. But my post was slightly different again, was to bring all the representatives from New Zealand agencies in Washington to, Washington to a Monday morning meeting to share information, but also importantly, to again ensure we all had a consistent New Zealand message. The independent New Zealand Foreign Service was established at the same time that the old order of the European powers controlling and dictating to their many colonies was at the beginning of the end. The British Empire was on the way out after India declared independence in 1945. India was followed by all other colonies. Sadly, very sadly, many had to fight bitter wars to gain their independence. History is fixed, but the legacy can still dominate. My parents were born into a united island, but before they left to migrate to New Zealand in 1930, London politics in the 1920s had divided Ireland. That legacy, a divided Ireland, is now the biggest problem that Britain is grappling with, with Brexit. The irony of how history comes back and bites you. Somebody might, at some stage, suggest to the British, why not a united Ireland again? And then the gap between the EU and the Brits would be the Irish Sea. I conclude by noting that tomorrow's generation of MFAT personnel will have to grapple with a world that is more divided on identity politics. That will include helping to prepare policy briefs for ministers that provide the necessary insights into a new world order that will do that new world order when the dominant nation will be China and one in four world citizens will likely live in Africa. MFAT trade experts relax. MFAT trade experts, <laughs> had to tell him all that all the time when he was a journalist, <laughs> uh, will be focused on how New Zealand taps into the huge trade agreement that has been worked on that will stretch from Cape Town to Cairo. On that journey, New Zealand, uh, no, that, uh, New Zealand journey, the staff of the ministry will have to continue to play in the front row, pushing forward the position adopted by the government of the day. The good news is, that while at times there will be differences between governments on certain policies, the generally independent thrust of New Zealand's policies will remain constant. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy the day. Well, well, thank you, Jim and Helen. We have, uh, if you wish, six minutes uh, for a question or two, or a comment or two, or an objection or two. <laughs> or, do I have somebody? Yes, no, no. <coughs> no. Oh. Well. Now, this is, this is a bit of a worry. The diplomatic corps has gone silent, Helen. Um, is this, the, does this mean it's subservient to prime ministers? And uh, as of course it should be. No one, no one wishes to raise a point. Then you should go into journalism. <laughs> yes. um, 
I should what? As a journalist? Yes. Go into journalist mode. Yes. <laughs> Revert to type. Um, well, you've both talked about the uh, value of the uh, Foreign Service and, and it's in both international uh, engagements of the UN and uh, the ILO that Jim mentioned and also, at the, um, uh, and also in bilateral relations. Um, to what extent, Helen first and then Jim, uh, do you as a Prime Minister lead the discussion and the forming of the position, and to what extent uh, are you led? I think it very much depends on the issue and whether uh, parties have gone into government with a you know, fairly firm set of ideas. Uh, but that's not the case across a very wide range of foreign policy issues. Uh, where you will receive briefings and you know, weigh up the, the advice uh, and make a decision. So the, the advice of MFAT is, is extremely influential in all those policy areas that are somewhat open, shall you say, as to right. what is the best way to advance the New Zealand interest. Influential in the sense that they know what they're talking about, they understand know what the world, have the connections. And they um, will brief on what, what the issue is, what the options could be, and you know, give, give you some choices. Now, you might say, well, come back with some better options, but, you yeah. know, <laughs> which they so could also do. But I, I think, you know, often in, in politics, we think of things of you know, being very black and, black and white. There are so many areas of policy, and it's not just foreign affairs, where things are rather more open to what is the evidence, you know, what's the case, how would you proceed? Right. And that's where officials yep. can obviously have a great deal of influence. Thank you. Mm. Jim? I agree with Helen. The, uh, the reliance we have on the expertise of officials in a variety of areas, and I touched on uh, Central Asia, now, the general knowledge of New Zealanders, and that includes just about 99% of those that are in Parliament on that part of the world, sadly, is, is quite limited. We don't have big engagement there. So experts on the ground or back here in Wellington are essential. But there's also the opportunity, and Helen touched on this, to use events to advance issues. And the terrible 9-11 attack when I was ambassador in Washington on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and so forth, gave New Zealand a chance to demonstrate that while we disagreed with the US on the nuclear issue, we didn't disagree with them across the board. We didn't dislike Americans or anything like that some of our critics tried to put forward. So it is and does require to be a team effort. The politicians have policy frameworks, policy ambitions, goals, etc., and it can look at times like there's enormous divi divergence between the major political parties. Sometimes it's a matter of nuance rather than uh, great gaps, and, uh, and the officials are the ones who can find or help find the way forward for ministers, prime ministers, everybody else. So hugely important role. Th th thank you. There's, there's one other question, and that it was actually touched on, I think, by Brooke in his comments, and that's uh, that need to bring the domestic public service and the foreign service uh, together so that we are a country that depends very much on our international relations. Uh, we're a very open, small economy. Uh, to what extent, in your experience, was there a divide between uh, the foreign service and the rest of the country, and to what extent did you think that they actually did have that sense that there needed to be a unified public service approach? It's not, not easy really to, to comment on that, but I think uh, often there was a, a frustration at ambassador level that you would have a post that would, you know, I mean, obvious example, in Washington DC, the ambassador is there, but there's a whole lot of other fiefdoms in the embassy. Mm. If, if you go to the New Zealand High Commission in London or Australia, uh, the MFAT team may be quite a small proportion of the overall complement, and yet someone has to lead it. And I think, Jim, you referred in your comments to, to what you did as ambassador in DC to, to get mm. all the troops together yes. around the same table so that everyone's working uh, in the same way. I think, 
you know, in a way, this sustainable development agenda for the UN calls for the same kind of role, uh, by MFAT, in my opinion, yes. because it's not obvious who else could do it yes. to sort of bring together all the strands of of, of policy and you know get get a sort of consolidated New Zealand view and 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 interest. So I think the ministry should be supported to play that role uh, at at the post level, uh, but also on these but, overarching issues uh, in international agendas, where a number yeah. of different departments, ministers, fiefdoms have views. Yeah. Does it also mean, Jim, that the domestic policy makers and, and, uh, and public servants need to be international as well. So that often we think of the foreign service as being out there somewhere doing things. A country and, like and, New uh, Zealand. Gabs Markluf has talked about this uh, mm -hmm. quite frequently, about the need to internationalise our, our uh, policy generally. I think we need to internationalise our education as well so that uh, the next generation of citizens have a broader view of the world, certainly than what I was taught uh, when I went to a modest high school. Um, and I think what Helen said is right, and what I did in Washington is what we need to do. I used to bring everybody in, the defence, the trade people, the foreign policy people, the immigration people, etc., all to a common meeting on a Monday. So they knew, A, what this stupid ambassador was thinking, but they also knew what everybody else was thinking about. So it would be and good so if that was happening in New Zealand too, wouldn't it, in Wellington? Well, it has to happen. Uh, New Zealand is too small to have a fragmented approach facing the world. The world is a very large place, and we'll get to nine or ten billion people and we'll get to five, you know, so just, just do the arithmetic as to uh, what we have to do. We will never, and I, I think the importance of having a clear position that Helen and I have argued, we will never be in a position ever to dictate to the world or to any country in it, maybe a tiny Pacific nation. So the only way we can persuade the world to listen to and perhaps follow some initiatives that we think should be taken is by leadership and showing that it works. The one that's front of mind, of course, is 125 years ago when women got the vote in New Zealand, 1893. It was considered madness, let's be honest about it. It was a highly risky business back then, but we led. We have led on other places, but we, ha we mustn't just relax and say, well, look, that's great. We have to be consciously focusing our foreign and our domestic policy to advance that which is right. And I think uh, we do that, we can sell it to others. Thank, thank you, Jim. Uh, the idea of celebrating is, uh, is top of mind, I think, this morning, is it? Uh, and thank you very much for your, your considered comments uh, and weaving together your experience as Prime Minister and backbenchers and ministers of uh, various sorts uh, with your interaction with the Foreign Service. It's been great. And thank you Thanks, very Colin. much indeed. Thank you.